I spend a lot of time training our staff. September is National Preparedness Month, so we've done um, a lot of different trainings. We've put on active shooter training, Employee Preparedness 101. Um, we did an evacuation drill. We've done an EOC exercise that focused on a wildland fire because Brea has a large wildland area. Um, this morning, I was an evaluator for another jurisdiction, City of Huntington Beach, for their exercise. And then I also do a lot of training for the public. Specifically, the largest one would be our CERT training, which is Community Emergency Response Team, where I train the public. We have uh, over 260 graduates that live in Brea, over 300 altogether that we've trained in the last five years to be prepared right where they stand. And so we're putting that together. Great. All right, so David, please. Um, <coughs> excuse me. Uh, Helitac Superintendent for the US Forest Service. I basically hire and train my uh, helicopter crews to work with aviation assets in wildland fire suppression. Uh, we travel all the uh, western states uh, from uh, Montana all the way to New Mexico, Arizona, sometimes over to Florida, uh, but manage aviation assets for uh, fire suppression. Mm -hmm. uh, we repel, uh, we do uh, aerial ignition, uh, we do search and rescue, uh, and we also do troop transport and also bucket operations with water for uh, fire suppression uh, for the U.S. Forces. Um, I am a criminalist with the Los Angeles Police Department, um, specifically, basically the City of Los Angeles Crime Lab, and I work in the Scientific Investigation Division, and more importantly, I'm in the Serology DNA Unit, so I know there's a whole lot of breakdown in there. <laughs> and um, basically, there's a bunch of different parts of the lab that I could have potentially worked in, narcotics, um, uh, serology DNA, firearms, um, um, blank trace, there's a whole bunch of them, but specifically what I do is the analysis of evidence for biological fluids, identifying those fluids, and then taking them on for DNA analysis, which is hopefully identifying whose profile we can get from those biological fluids. And then once I have done all of that stuff in the lab, I write reports on my findings, and I also testify to those findings in court. I'm the general manager for the police department. Um, at the same time, along with the fire chief in our community, I'm also the lead coordinator for emergency preparedness for the city. We maintain uh, an emergency operations center, which is located at the police department. And as part of that position, we are constantly trying to evaluate our greatest risks, whether they're man-made or natural for some sort of large incident. Uh, in our city and uh, training and preparing for those types of incidents. So I have a lot of different responsibilities, but one of the principal ones is emergency preparedness for our city. For a city our size, uh, we can't afford uh, a full-time, permanent, uh, dedicated emergency preparedness coordinator um, like the city uh, of, of Brea has. So, so the, the way that a small city does that is by delegating that to the fire chief and police chief. All right, and Travis, you're up. Uh, so I am a, a member of the Napa County Sheriff Search and Rescue and the uh, California Explorer Search and Rescue Mutual Aid Team. And basically, we do search and rescue operations for lost hikers, hunters, kids. Uh, we also do fire evacuations, flood evacuations, and uh, recently a lot of Alzheimer's uh, cases. And in California, uh, search and rescue is delegated to the sheriff's department, and uh, so we run out of the sheriff's department and coordinated with the state of California through the emergency management agency. Um, California is one of the leaders in search and rescue, uh, but we're also 95% volunteer, so it's really incredible um, that we set such high standards in the state. Um, I'm currently a logistics officer on the Napa County team as well as an operations officer, which is basically a search manager or incident commander for specific incidents. Um, so we are on call 24 seven, but again, we're volunteers and uh, we do what we can when we can, um, when the calls go out. So now we're very lucky to have Travis Wiley with us, but we understand that he actually has to go back to a work meeting at 7.30. So what we're going to do is we're going to direct our questions to you first, Travis. Um, we're going to also allow students to ask <coughs> Travis questions directly since he won't be here for the question and answer portion. And then we're going to let you go on your way back to work. All right, so how did you get involved in search and rescue? 
Uh, what what fueled your desire to volunteer and get involved in this particular area? Um, that's an excellent question. Uh, I ask myself all the time. I was actually at Whittier in uh, Harris B when I started to go online to find something that was kind of exciting that got me out there. Um, I was Boy Scouts growing up, so I loved the outdoors and kind of wanted to do something fun. And um, I looked online, and uh, there is a team, the California Explorer Search and Rescue, up in the Bay Area that kind of fit my schedule. And um, I applied, and I really loved it. Uh, it's crisis management, it's stress, uh, it's emotion, it's, it's a lot of things that I enjoy. Um, and it's a volunteer thing, so I, I didn't have to do a full-time career in this. Um, I could still pursue other things that I wanted to do. Um, but, you know, search and rescue is solving complex problems and mysteries, and there's no right answer to these things, and you just have to go off your knowledge and training and, and uh, gut instincts, and all that was through search and rescue, and that's just something that really got me uh, connected to the program. And once I was in it, I was hooked and joined Napa County just so I could get more calls. So you discovered this while you were still a student at Whittier College, and it sounds like you didn't let that get in the, in the way of uh, finishing your degree and pursuing another job, so I'm wondering how Whittier College supported you uh, during this time as you were pursuing this volunteer activity. Yeah, no, uh, Whittier was incredibly supportive uh, of me doing this. Um, after about six months of doing this, I was talking with my advisor, and he told me to go to the athletic department because they give college credit for activities like this that are physical, outdoor, leadership, kind of management stuff. And I received, I think, five or six units of credit um, just from doing something that I already wanted to do and, and uh, enjoyed doing. And then a lot of times we got called um, in the middle of the night and I had to send an email to my professor saying, you know, I can't make it to class tomorrow or I can't do the work. And uh, they were very supportive and said, no worries. And uh, I think my best story is my senior year, my last test, two days before graduation, we had a call. And um, normally I wouldn't go for that, but uh, it was a buddy of mine's son who was out lost. So I flew up to uh, Northern California to help him. And so I postponed my final test uh, a day before I graduated. And the professor was totally cool with it. He just said I had to get my grades in by four, so I'll just do it by then. And um, somehow I came back, passed the test, and uh, graduated the next day. So uh, Whittier's definitely supported me and, and uh, what I've done with this. So it's really been great. And did you find a little boy? Uh, we did. Uh, not in the best circumstances, though. So, but that's, uh, that's the kind of life of search and rescue and emergency management. So, you know, that being said, this is a high-risk job and you don't always have the best outcomes. Um, what kind of advice would you give to some of the students in here that are thinking that they might want to do some kind of volunteer service that's similar? Where do they start? Um, so, basically, search and rescues run out of counties. Um, so, I looked into L.A. County, and L.A. County is the 5% where you have to be a peace officer to be involved, which is a whole nother realm. But uh, I live in Contra Costa County. You can be a member there, uh, Napa County. Um, just go online. They all have websites. Just do uh, Napa County Search and Rescue or uh, Madero County Search and Rescue, wherever you're from, and apply. And Search and Rescue requires all types of people. You need field people. You need radio people. You need back office, fundraisers, everything. So it's really open to, um, to anything. And there's a lot of areas you can go into. Uh, there's tech rescue, ATVs, horses, canines, swift water, uh, tracking, so a lot of different fields that uh, you can go into. And uh, I really recommend it, but it's a it's a definitely a time commitment, um, and uh, there's definitely some stuff you'll go through, but you're part of everything. They don't hold back depending on your age or skill level or anything. And when I joined, that's what I wanted. I didn't, I wanted to be involved with every aspect of it, and uh, I've been loving it ever since. Thank you. So, students, do you have any questions that you want to ask Travis directly? Please. Um, I was just curious, like, what type of training did you have to go through in order to get to where you are now? Yeah, so most people 
basically do a year round calendar. Um, every month there's a training plus some, sometimes an additional training and you basically do outdoor skills, search and rescue skills, text rescue, uh, communications, winter skills, and each team does it differently. But, um, you know, you just got to really check in with the team. They have like an orientation week where you go and they explain it all to you, but it's usually a boot camp followed by seven months of training and then you're, um, then you're base level certified. And um, beyond that, then you can take many different courses and um, offered by different people and all that kind of stuff. But just, I would say go to the meetings. They're open to having people in, doesn't matter what time of the year. And then you get a feel for kind of how it's run in that county. And each county is totally different. So it's tough for me to tell, tell you how it's, how it's done. Are you, are you from California? Yes, I'm from Bakersfield. What county is that? Kern County. Kern County. They have a very, uh, very well-respected big team and a lot of off-roading, so it would be a good team to be a part of. Thank you. Thank you. One thing, uh, since you're on past positions, you're a ground pounder. <laughs> what exactly is that? Uh, <laughs> Yeah, that's basically a fancy way of being the uh, the grunt. We uh, send you out in the field for six hours and give you a little bit of water and say, go find the guy. Um, yeah, that's, that's kind of our nickname for it, I guess. I, I could have put field technician, but that, that sounded too glorified, I think. <laughs> but every, every organization needs every part of, from everyone, so... It's just as important as the people in the trailer or uh, first aid people. Um, you know. That's right. Thank you. Thank you for sharing your experience and your insights with us. We really do appreciate it, especially your time. And you know, that being said, we'll we'll let you go so you can go back to your meeting. Um, yeah. No. Thanks for having me. This is an incredible panel you guys assembled and some serious backgrounds. And I uh, wish I could be there longer, but it's just really impressive. So I'm glad I could be a part of it and part of this panel. Thank you. We wish you safe rescues. Well, and I, I think like most longtime emergency managers, they didn't start out that way. 32 years ago, the term didn't even really exist. Um, and so I started out uh, when I graduated from Whittier. I went to work at Fullerton PD, and I was a community service specialist. And then I went over to Brea Fire Department. I was a fire prevention specialist. I learned how to do inspections, um, fire inspections, all those kinds of things. All of those laid a tremendous groundwork for me when the position um, first became available in Brea. I applied. Um, they were hoping I would get it. They were hoping I wouldn't flub it. And I did, I did okay on the panel. So I've been their emergency manager for about 22 and a half years. And um, it is a, a constant evolutionary process. And the degree in public administration has served me very well, as did my degree in sociology. My background <coughs> is, um, actually, I wanted to teach juvenile delinquents. Um, that was my goal. I was training to teach high school um, and I did my internship at Fred C. Nellis and found out that was not what I was going to do the rest of my life. So um, it, I encourage you all, do your internship. If nothing else, it tells you what you don't want to do um, or do want to do. So um, it's a, a very evolutionary process and I think a lot of people happen their way into careers like that. And um, uh, the key is to just be open to experiences, open to um, different job opportunities and taking what you can get out of each and every job that you encounter. Great. So to go off of what you just said, um, I know that you also serve on regional and state committees in yeah. addition to your day job. Mm -hmm. So could you tell us a little bit about how you find those opportunities? What, how, how do those things come to you? Does networking play a role in that? Huge. Okay. Huge. Um, I, I think that that's one of the, for me, one of the most exciting parts of my job is the opportunity to work on regional and state level committee, committees. You get an opportunity, for example, I was on um, the governor's um, year 2000 committee. Well, that was kind of exciting to be meeting in the governor's boardroom for two years while we planned for Y2K, which was really a non-event, but we spent two years planning for it nonetheless. Um, so, but it was a, a great opportunity to meet people literally across all disciplines who were working together to try to solve a problem. And those relationships 
um, become invaluable in times of emergency because it's not just about knowing the job. You have to know the job, but it's also about knowing how to identify when the system is broken, who do I need to call to get it fixed? Because my responsibility is to connect people together and to get the right resources at the right place at the right time. Um, I don't actually do the response, but I need to set up the groundwork that allows that response to happen. And so relationships are key. And a lot of it is being willing. Someone says and they come to you, um, we've got this opportunity, are you willing to do that? In your head you think, I am slammed right now. But you smile and you go, sure, I'll do that. And often those lead to things that you never anticipated. I was wondering, I mean, I, when I talked to you earlier, you said that you do some mentoring yeah. um, people in, within your field. And would you tell us a little bit more about what you think, what, what kind of role mentorship can play in one's career? And for students that are looking for a mentor, what kind of qualities they should be looking for? Sure. Uh, mentorship is actually, I consider, the bonus of outlasting most of my peers. Um, I love to, to provide the the background um, for things that uh, emergency management changes constantly and I love to be able to tell people they look at something maybe a law or a process and they go this doesn't make any sense I can usually tell them how we got there it still may not make it make sense but I can give you the background on FEMA I can talk about <coughs> different FEMA directors and the policies they put in place or policies that they undid to try to improve a process I can talk about different governors, I can talk about things that they've done, and I see a lot of heads not, yeah, because you can talk about how it happens. And so you take someone who comes in who's eager to learn, and I can give them background. Or it might be that you're facing a fork in the road, and you're saying, gosh, I have this opportunity and I have this opportunity. I'm not sure which one's going to lead me where I want to go. And it's not just about the job title, it's about what you're going to gain within that job that may benefit you later. And I can often help um, through discussion, find out what your ultimate goals, what your interests are. Sometimes when you're brand new, you don't even know what you're good at or what you really want to do. But if I talk to you, I can find out a little bit about what your interests and your passions are and help put you in a place that can help develop that for further down the road. That's great. Thank you. So, one more question for you. Okay. What are the skills that you feel like you use every day, things that are indispensable. What, what are those skills that you need for your job and maybe are some, of, some of the skills that our students need? Um, well, you need to be um, collaborative. You need to be able to work with a lot of people. I'm a very rare position. Brea is not a big city, but I literally have to work with people from every single department in the city. And so you have to be able to bring people together for a common cause. That's really critical. If you are antagonistic as an emergency manager, you'll find yourself all alone in a room, and that won't get you where you need to go. Um, I find that you have to be able to multitask. One of the really big things that a lot of people don't identify as really critical for an emergency manager, you have to be comfortable with never being done. And a lot of people, if you're a check the box kind of person, this will make you nuts um, because you're never done. You finish your emergency plan and you immediately start working on the next one. Or, um, you know, let's talk about 9 11 and the impact it had on the job. The job I had in, um, you know, 1999 is not the job that I have today. It constantly changes and moves. And so you have to be very comfortable with getting rid of the old, taking what you need to carry forward, and getting rid of it and moving forward into the new. So you have to be really comfortable in that environment. Thank you very much, Anna. Especially with Whittier College, I'll have to say that um, something I think back on often, and at the time I didn't appreciate it, but when I was at Whittier College, and I don't know what they do now, but for every class, you had to write papers. And if, when I was in Whittier College, you were always writing a paper for some sort of class. And if you talk to people that go to undergraduate schools elsewhere, you'll find out they just don't write that many papers. And so my writing skills have really, really been important to me and to my success um, in, as a police chief and um, even as an attorney when I was in, in the practice of law for a while. And I attribute that to the strong emphasis on writing that, that's placed at Whittier College. And um, in addition, I think the small school environment there um, really fosters an ability to cultivate interpersonal relationships. And I really want to echo uh, what my colleague just said. Emergency management, working in government, working in any kind of management position is really about relationship building. 
Uh, you've, you've got to be able to, to talk to people and cultivate relationships. That's a huge part of it. So both on the uh, writing skills and communication skills in general piece, and you know, it, Winter College is like a family. It's a small community. Everybody knows everybody. And having gone on to two different institutions that were enormous in size, um, I, I really saw the difference. And you know, I attribute all of what I've been able to uh, build as a skill set for writing and dealing with, with other human beings to my four years of Whittier College. Uh, I, I don't participate in activities like this with my other schools because I, I don't really have that loyalty. So um, you know, being, being an attorney is a great skill set. Uh, it's helped me as a police chief because there's clearly a relationship between the law and that. But in terms of basic foundational skills, the, the four years at Whittier are, are something that definitely helped me significantly. Great. Based on what you know now in your career, uh, is there any class that you wish you had taken while you were here at Whittier College? That's a good question. Um, I, I, I really don't think so. Um, you know, I fell into where I ended up very much as also. Mm -hmm. And I think that's typical. As she said, the term emergency management didn't even exist back when I was in college. And, but it's been an emerging field, sadly, because the risks uh, have, have increased significantly. And we've had major key events that have changed everyone's way of looking at preparing. Um, I mean, you can't prevent man-made or uh, natural catastrophes. That's the term management really is. Uh, a, a very applicable term. It's all about controlling them and, and managing them. And um, I don't know that there was a, a class available that would have helped me. If there was, I would have certainly taken it. But I had um, no idea where I was going at the time, that's for sure. Do you have any advice that you'd like to give our Whittier students present here today? Um, they're interested in emergency management. Uh, how can they do some research to learn more about what's possible for them? Well. You know, I think they first have to decide. It, it, you know, let me also echo what Travis had said. It's, it's the most rewarding job uh, on the planet. Now, I'm a little bit biased in that regard, but um, it's extremely exciting. It's very, very rewarding, and it's important work. And I think that, um, you know, looking back, if I were trying to get into this and, and trying to give some advice, I'd, I'd look at where do you think you fit in? Because there's very different paths to emergency management. Now, because it's such a specific career path, you can either focus on the government side of things, like I did, um, and get into government work, police, fire, public safety, FEMA, some sort of federal law enforcement or emergency organization, the military. Those are all great paths, any government path. And that may uh, appeal to somebody based on their personality and their desires. But also equally important, I think, because it might appeal to other students, is the, the nonprofit sector is a great career path into emergency management. Um, the best example being the American Red Cross. I know a number of successful people in my profession and in emergency management that at some point started in, in careers with a nonprofit, such as the American Red Cross. Uh, one good friend of mine then went on to be the emergency preparedness coordinator for the United States Senate, a very uh, amazing position to, to hold. And so a nonprofit just might appeal to you better. So it's not all just about government, but th that those are really the, the two ways in, because there's also the private sector, but most people who are in, in emergency management in the private sector have backgrounds that started in either government or nonprofit. So um, the other big advice I would, I would have, a piece of advice, would be to get into volunteering. Uh, like Travis, when I was a freshman at Whittier College, I volunteered to be a reserve police officer with the Los Angeles Police Department. And that's what sort of got me on this path that eventually uh, caused me to give up being an attorney and pursue something that I had a passion for, which was police work, but morphed into emergency management, uh, to be sure. So any volunteer work you can do, like what Travis did, uh, does or what I did, or for some type of nonprofit, if that appeals to you more, is, is a really great starting point. Um, it's valued very highly by people like me who make hiring decisions uh, in the field of uh, emergency management. Forensic science is actually a very broad field. Like I said, within the crime lab, there's multiple units you could work in, and all of them have very different um, tests that you use. 
So what I actually was introduced to when I was in high school was a forensic pathologist job. And so I went to um, a National Youth Leadership Forum on Medicine in Houston, Texas, Houston, Texas and got to see the Houston Medical Examiner's Office. And that's where I had seen my first autopsy. And from then I said, I definitely want to be a forensic pathologist. That's my goal. So I w came into Whittier and knew that I, in order to become a forensic pathologist, I had to go on the med school track. And that consisted of taking all of the science courses and all of that type of stuff. So then as I was doing all of my coursework, I decided in my junior year that I just didn't want to go to med school. That wasn't for me. But luckily within the Houston Medical Examiner's Office, I was able to see other aspects of forensic science. I saw the forensic photographers and some toxicologists came in and all of these people were working really closely with the forensic pathologist. And I went, wait a second, I don't think I ever thought about these other jobs that are out there that are closely related. And um, I had the opportunity of meeting another Whittier alumni who had come and done a talk with the chemistry department and he was actually the um, crime lab director for LAPD at the time. And so he gave a talk about the crime lab and I went, I think I'm gonna look into doing that. And so from then on, I applied to the Cal State LA criminalistics program and got in there and then completed my master's there and applied to all of the other crime labs in the area and ended up at Los Angeles Police Department. That's great. Can you tell us a little bit more about networking and the role it's played in your career? Of course. Um, I mean, everything I did, I'm a super social person. <laughs> I love to talk. I love to meet people. Um, my dad was in, in the Air Force, and so I moved around a lot, so I got used to always meeting new people. And so when I came to Whittier, I immediately wanted to talk to anybody that would, you know, tell me how they would could get anywhere. So especially trying to get into med school, it was so competitive. So I was like, what are the things that I need to do? Um, so, of course, I talked to a lot of people about what courses to take, and so that's how I ended up with a biochemistry major. Um, but like I said, the important ones were um, my professors were able to bring in this alumni who came in and gave us a talk about the crime lab. So I actually talked to him for a little bit to figure out how do I actually go about doing this. And unfortunately, there's not a lot of like mentoring programs for getting into a crime lab or anything like that, because a lot of stuff is highly guarded. You can't actually bring somebody in without background clearance and stuff like that. So I didn't really know what to do and that's when he told me about going into the master's program at Cal State LA. And the master's program at Cal State LA works very, very closely with the Los Angeles Police Department and with the Sheriff's Department crime lab. So once I got into that um, program there, the professors were really good about helping me find a person that I could do my thesis with that would get me in the door. And I worked with a man named Reef Hardy who was brilliant and he helped me do my thesis. And from then, I just started talking to all the people within the crime lab and how do I get a job in here? What do I need to do? So networking is a huge, huge thing that you have to do. And so don't be scared to talk to people because you never know who might be able to help you achieve your goals. Thank you. Um, aside from networking you know, through classes and again with other working professionals, what are some other things that Whittier students can do while they're here um, to, again, get this kind of exposure, um, whether it's through activities or pursuing, pursuing certain degree programs. Do you have any advice? As um, Anna, I, I'm so horrible with names. That's a bad thing here. As Anna said, um, internships are amazing things. I mean, I had the opportunity to go to this forum on medicine and was able to go into the Houston Medical Examiner's Office that could have been a horrible career path had I not seen an autopsy and been like, I'm going to become a forensic pathologist and never have done that. So definitely trying to get your feet wet and figuring out whether you enjoy that type of work or whether you even enjoy that field is something that I would recommend because um, Whittier didn't have, a, they don't have a really strong forensic because it's very specific. But there are a lot of people, I mean, I had a great department, the chemistry department was really good at t helping me determine how I can take my major and this really broad major type thing and get it into that really specific field that I was trying to get into. So an internship and just trying to find people who have these um, jobs that you're looking for are the most important thing. Thank you, Sam. 
And last but certainly, certainly <laughs> not least, we have Dave Medham. So Dave, when you were here at Whittier, you were involved in a wide range of co-curricular activities. So play football, basketball, racquetball. Um, you're also a student leader here on campus. I'm curious to know what you think the, the kind of impact all your involvement had on your choice of a career and the trajectory of your career. Oh, wow. <laughs> um, I think it was the interpersonal relations, uh, mostly. Mm -hmm. uh, networking is a huge tool. We all hit on networking. All my colleagues have talked about networking. Uh, being part of those groups, uh, being part of football, basketball, uh, the Lancer Society, uh, working at the Shannon Center with the, with the, uh, the actors and, and the folks there. Um, a lot of interpersonal relations. Um, a lot of different skills came out, um, a lot of different leadership skills. Uh, whether leading on the football field, uh, whether it being a stage manager at the Shannon Center, or whether being um, with the Lancer Society and say, you know, uh, an issue popped or arose, we had to go deal with that. Um, it gave me a lot of different uh, avenues to look at things in a different light, and that's huge uh, with emergency management. Um, the only thing constant uh, is change in emergency management. Everything is always changing. It's a constantly changing environment. And being able to adapt to those environments, um, I believe, it helped me immensely here. Uh, uh, I was a resident advisor here in Johnson Hall for uh, uh, two semesters, uh, resident advisor. A lot of issues came up with students at that time, but it, was, it felt good helping them out and getting through those, uh, those issues and the situations. Um, so I think the interpersonal relations are the biggest thing that helped me out here and uh, helped develop my career as a helitax superintendent. Um, That's great. So you had a number of different roles with progressive responsibility <coughs> at the mm -hmm. U.S. Uh, Forest Service, and I was wondering if you could tell us if that's typical for someone in your career, and if again, I know you're saying that things do change, but is there really a is there a typical career path that they can anyone can expect? Um, I didn't expect to fall into this career at all, actually. Along with my colleagues, we didn't expect to be where we are at this point. Um, the education here was was key for kind of seeing that. Um, in my path, there are definite paths for different careers. Uh, there's different disciplines in the Forest Service for fire management. There's engine crews, there's hotshot crews, um, there's helitac crews, uh, there's battalion chiefs, division chiefs, fire chiefs. Uh, we have tanker bases, tanker base managers. So there's a lot of different paths you can go into. Um, I wanted to be a ground pounder, going back to where we had before. <laughs> I was a ground pounder for a lot of times. Uh, fire was actually a job for me to help pay for college when I was here. I started in 1991. Uh, missed first week, two weeks of football in 92 because I was on a fire. <laughs> so they're like, show up when you can, be here when you get back. It's like, okay, thank you. Um, so, uh, I lost train of thought there. Um, but not a lot of, uh, uh, there's a lot of career paths that you can go into. Uh, aviation for me is what I finally found out was my love in 1999. I went to the helicopter in 1999. Got uh, assigned there for uh, the fire season, and I haven't left actually. <laughs> I stayed right where I am. Uh, I got into aviation and said, I really like this job. This is a passion that I really, I'm really into right now. I'm definitely afraid of heights, but I love flying in helicopters. I, I can't put my finger on it. Um, but I believe you can, you can have different career paths as you go into the Forest Service, whether it be management, whether it be running engines, whether it be helicopters, whether it be hotshot crews. So there's definitely paths you can go into. And you know, one of the things that we haven't talked about, but it's it's in every job, and especially in your field, is stress. Mm -hmm. So, how do you deal with the stress around <laughs> your job? Ah, uh, stress. You have to have a sense of humor. Uh, emergency management. You have to have a good sense of humor. You have to have good relations with your colleagues, uh, and be able to talk about situations. Mm -hmm. um, we have a really good um, critical incident stress group with the Forest Service. Uh, we've had a lot of tragedies the last you know ten years, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. Uh, but we learn from those, but you also have times where you can get really good help and deal with those situations. I have a lot of uh, outdoor activities I do. I love, I love to hike, I love to fish, I skateboard, I surf, I snowboard, um, I coach basketball. Those are great stress reliefs for me because uh, I'm active. I'm actually helping people develop themselves. Um, but for me, snowboarding is probably my big, biggest stress relief. I can go out, put some music in, and just deal with what has happened over the last you know, year or so but have those stress reliefs. Even here in college, uh, find hobbies, find things you can do. Um, workload gets huge sometimes. You know, stresses at home get huge. You have to find creative ways to deal with that stress and those challenges. That's great, thank you. If you're interested in a career in emergency management, CERT's a great exposure to a lot of different areas since all the modules are about three hours long. Um, I know that at the end of your CERT class, they gave you the link to the FEMA courses. 
seriously, you could spend the rest of your life taking <laughs> piano classes. Um, but I would recommend that you go on and find the classes that interest you. Right now, they're free. They give you a beautiful certificate um, and that give you an exposure to what's out there and help you fine tune that. If you were to be looking at something like teaching or whatever, um, and my youngest daughter is now a teacher, and she is kind of the, the boss of the hall because she was raised in an emergency <coughs> management household. She's, her dad's a, a retired police lieutenant. She was raised in that environment. So she understands emergencies, thinks clearly. And so I think with CERT, if you get like um, opportunities to go back for refreshers, to get exposure, like we did active shooter training for my CERT people, just kind of a bonus class this month. And so for a lot of them, I have a number of teachers, um, people who work in business, they can take that back and implement it right where they stand. And I think that there's tremendous value. I guarantee a principal would be thrilled to see somebody with that training, you would end up in charge of a committee. Guarantee. <laughs> <laughs> I think the great thing about Whittier College is you've got a lot of professors here that basically do their whole careers almost here at Whittier. And so they are one of the best resources you will ever get because they have seen almost every, and most of us keep in touch with our professors that we were close with. And so it's like you can talk to them and if you're not sure what you're looking at going into, just start asking them what other types of jobs have former alumni gone into. And I'm sure they talk to each other too, so even if it's not in your department, they'll say, go talk to so-and-so over here. Mm -hmm. He'll be, Dr. So-and-so can tell you more about that because I know they've had students go on to do that. Because the professors here are amazing at being able to help you and guide you on your way. Well, so, <laughs> one of the things that you might consider, you know, I was an Athenian, and I know that at our brunch la um, last year when I introduced myself and gave my, all you did was introduce yourself, gave a job title, just a few basics. I had um, two people who were interested, um, one working an active internship, mm -hmm. who had questions for me because her internship was very narrow, and then another one who was looking for an internship. So it, it, it's, it's all about the networking. You know, these are folks that because I was at the Athenian brunch, they heard me say that and they approached me. I'm more than happy. Gave them business cards. We were off and running with a number of phone calls. So Whittier Weekend is a great opportunity. Hit them early though, because we kind of got things going on. <laughs> <laughs>